Okay, and again, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for joining this webinar today, which covers the positive contribution of forests towards greenhouse gas mitigation. I work as a specialist within the Tagusk Forestry Development Department, which provides integrated research, advisory, and training supports to the farm forestry sector in Ireland. So just to go through briefly the topics today, a brief overview of the forest resource in Ireland. We will look at mitigation pathways, including those within and outside the forest. I will present indicative data for sequestration by forest category, and we will have a look at implications up to 2030 and beyond. I will briefly look at riparian woodland and its associated benefits, We'll have a look at ongoing research to help, that, to help build forest re resilience, and I will briefly cover hedgerows and potential for mitigation. Okay, so th they are the main topics. And maybe just to set the scene first, we have a significant forest resource in Ireland, which can be further harnessed to provide multiple benefits for society. And 11% of our land area is under forest cover, as you can see from the map. We have almost 23,000 private forest owners, the majority farmers, who own almost half of our forest resource. And the picture outlines the target's role in facilitating knowledge exchange in the forest. We have an export oriented forest product sector with exports reaching almost 430 million in 2018. And again, Looking at jobs, activities such as forest nursery operations, forest establishment, management, and the utilization of wood provide sustainable employment, mainly in rural areas. And through our work there, we, we, we try and show that forests can complement other farming enterprises and be a developing resource on the farm. And from the environmental side, um, well-designed and sustainably managed forests have an important role in the provision of the services that more and more people are looking for. And these include carbon mitigation, provision of recreation, biodiversity enhancement, as well as water quality benefits. So that's just a brief overview. And maybe just as a couple of open, opening comments, um, it is important to point out that forests can't provide the full answer to climate mitigation but still they have a highly significant role to play. In farming, for example, we can also achieve considerable emission reductions through the agricultural mitigation pathways and the good practice adoption measures as, as outlined in the Chagask MAC curve, which has been covered in previous webinars. Another statement I would make that climate change is not the only reason for sustainably expanding our forest resource. And there is a clear and ongoing need for a balance between sustainable wood production and realizing the social and environmental roles underpinned by sustainable forest management in new and existing forests. So that, that balance between the economy, society and environment is very important as it is in, within agriculture. So just to br briefly look at the planting categories, Farmers and landowners considering forestry have a range of 12 grant and premium categories, or GPCs for short as they're called. And these are available under the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine Afforestation Scheme. And the scheme caters for all types of forests, including, as I'm showing, uh, conifer options, broadleaf options. There are native woodland categories and agroforestry, as you see in, in this slide, which integrates trees and farming. And there's the forestry for fibre category, which facilitates growing of productive species for wood energy and other uses. And I suppose the message here is that a suitable mix of these categories can be combined on any planting application and subsequently managed using different silvicultural options. And in this way, we can meet multiple objectives for landowners. So looking at forest carbon, and we have obligations for 
National Forest Inventory Reporting to the United Nations Fra Framework um, Convention on Climate Change and under the, the Kyoto Protocol also. And at forest level, carbon balances are based on the net carbon emissions or removals from five pools. And these are reservoirs of carbon. So we've got the above ground biomass pool, the below ground biomass pool, the litter pool, which is the um, material coming from the trees, such as leaves or, or needles, and the dead wood pool, and finally the soil carbon pool. So there are the five pools. We also hear of the term fluxes, which are carbon transfers from one pool to another. And the forest modeling framework that, are, that is used for reporting includes all carbon fluxes associated with these pools that I'm showing. So carbon dioxide is taken out of the atmosphere and sequestered, or in other words, it's taken up by the trees during photosynthesis with a corresponding release of oxygen. And the rate of carbon uptake is affected by many factors. We also get long-term allocation of carbon into above and below, below ground forest biomass and turnover of biomass and into the soils and dead organic matter. We get a sometimes a loss of carbon as a result of respiration by trees, both above and below ground, as well as decomposition or oxidation of soil organic matter. And if carbon uptake in the forest exceeds loss, the forest is called a sink. Or if the loss exceeds the uptake, the forest is called a source. The final output is the sum of the carbon stock changes within the forest system. And looking, looking at estimating carbon, this slide presents the national forest carbon stock as estimated in the 2017 National Forest Inventory. And you can see from the graph of the total stock of about 312 million tons of carbon, almost 80% is contained in forest soils, which is by far the largest pool in the forest scenario. The National Inventory also tells us that on average, our national forest resource takes up 4.3 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents per hectare per year. And this is an average figure representing different tree species, different soil types, varying ages and harvesting levels. Carbon mitigation comes from a range of processes. So we have looked at sequestration in the, in the growing forest. Also what is termed the land substitution effect is relevant and this relates to the preceding land use prior to planting. This land use may have been emitting or removing carbon, concrete and steel and perhaps the ultimate example is Mie Starnet in Norway which at over 85 meters it's currently the world's tallest timber building and construction was reputedly inspired by the Paris Agreement. A key factor in this construction is the use of engineered wood, such as glue lamp, and it requires an estimated one-sixth of the energy used to produce the steel fittings of comparable structures. Overall, between 11 and 13,000 trees sourced from Norwegian forests supplied most of the wood for this innovative project. So it gives an, an idea of the overall um, potential benefits across the range. So if you're coming back to more common construction projects, and I believe we sometimes take for granted the value and versatility of wood, the whole series of uses it can be put to, and the carbon that is stored within each. So if we just look around the building we are in today, I think we can be fairly sure we are spatially very close to a host of wood-based products as illustrated in this image from Forest Industry Ireland. And according to the European Forestry Institute, every tonne of timber used instead of energy intensive products, for example, cement and steel, 
results in an avoided emission of up to two tonnes of carbon dioxide. So moving on to what we call the forest or stand level processes, just to give a bit of clarity on these. And this slide presents pathways to increase total carbon stocks over three rotations. So you can see in purple, this representation of the three rotations. So at forest level, the green curves represent managed forest carbon stock, which we see is cyclical and approaches a steady state over three rotations. The second pathway represented by the brown curve is the long-term storage of timber in harvested wood products. As you can see, this is a very significant area. It builds over time, over the three rotations, and over successive forest cycles, more wood products are added to, to this pool. The area in blue represents the replacement of fossil fuel-derived energy with biomass energy. And the final pathway, as we've seen previously, is the substitution of wood products for energy-intensive material. Finally, the dashed line in the image represents the indicative carbon stock in an unmanaged forest, which, as you can see, is only about one-fifth of the indicated carbon stock in a sustainably managed forest when all pathways are taken into account. This is a plant and, and clear fell system, an alternative approach to forest management we call continuous cover forestry is gaining considerable interest also. Though more challenging to quantify, it can also be an effective approach in terms of delivering long-term cl climate benefits and carbon mitigation. So looking at the grant and premium categories we've already covered. This slide shows recent analysis of indicative sequestration rate for these different categories. And these are potential values, I must stress, with an associated range of assumptions. And they are normalized to an average carbon sequestration rate and expressed in tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare per year over two rotations. The reason for this is that it allows for like with like comparisons for different species and rotation ages. And the values that I am presenting here include on-site forest emissions and removals, removals from the harvested wood products, and emission avoidance by substitution of fossil fuel energy. So looking at the slide, we see that highly productive forests, coupled with an optimized allocation to harvested wood products, provides the largest sequestration benefit on suitable soils. So for example, GPC3, which involves a, a strong yield class spruce forest with 15% birch inclusion and 15% biodiversity area, has on average an indicative sequestration close to 10 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare per year over the two rotation time frame. Similar rates are indicated for GPC-12, which is forestry for fibre category. In more general terms, broadly, species tend to take longer to accumulate and the same level of carbon stocks as common for crops due to their slower growth rates. It is also important to point out here that the sequestration rate changes for all species over a given rotation or time period and the potential figures outlined represent average rates. Just to touch on native woodlands for a moment, which are a very important resource, um, and attractive funding is available, as we've seen through GPC 9 and 10, to establish these, what I would call, national treasures. Um, this slide provides an indicative carbon sequestration for native woodlands, a range of native woodland types over a 100-year period. And we can see these vary according to factors such as species, soil, and site types, and the management approaches that are adopted. For suitable native wood, woodland projects, the Woodland Environmental Fund, which is administered through the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, offers an, an access point for businesses to provide additional financial support and incentive for landowners to plant new native woodland. 
and it can provide an innovative corporate social responsibility option and perhaps enhancing business reputation and social cohesion. And there are a number of examples of such collaborative approaches already in place around the country at the moment. To continue the theme for a moment and the appropriate design and location of new native woodlands combined with undisturbed water setbacks provides an exciting option that may help and protect water quality. And I think this has been referred to previous, in previous webinars. And this woodland for water measure developed by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine in conjunction with the Woodlands of Ireland and other stakeholders may offer solutions that may be considered in appropriate situations. And as you can see, perhaps adjoining productive agriculture, forests or the built environment. So to briefly look at the elements of the, the woodland for water measure is the water body, which is the, the element we, we look to protect. B represents a permanent undisturbed water setback that would be 10 to 25 meters in width, uncrossed by drains and largely unplanted. This can be widened strategically as required Limited planting of single or small groups of, of native trees can also be considered to deliver services such as, such as bank st stabilization, dappled shade, and as, as a source of aquatic food. C represents new native woodland, which will be 20 meters or greater, again uncrossed by drains, and it can also be widened strategically as required, where adjoining land use hydrology or slope may increase the vulnerability of receiving waters. And finally, in D, it represents possible interventions within existing drains, such as silt traps, slow flow dams, to break existing pathways from source to receiving waters to create pocket wetlands and settlement areas. So overall, an exciting opportunity here within this measure. So looking at mitigation pathways and flexibility is secured by Ireland under the EU effort sharing decision, which includes 5.6% of the 2005 base year emissions, amounts to 2.68 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent of land use, land use change and forestry, or LULU CF credits each year. And a significant portion of this will come from forestry. The slide I'm showing here shows the measures identified within the Chagas MAC curve under mitigation pathway two, which is LULU CF, or land use, land use change in forestry. And I suppose the take home message from this slide is that forestry has a considerable and cost effective contribution to make to the national abatement challenge with the potential to mitigate up to 2 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent each year up to 2030. However, we can ask the question, what are the implications for our current low planting rates? And just to move that on slightly, the LULU CF regulations use six land categories, and among these, it recognizes an afforested land category, which transitions to a managed forest land category, in Ireland's case, it will be over a 30-year transition period where it accords with the IPCC guidelines. And this is quite beneficial. But looking at a scenario where a 30-year transition continues, for example, it would in effect mean that by 2050, only new forests planted from 2021 onwards will contribute towards achieving the goal of carbon neutrality. And again, this scenario would be subject to any limitations in EU law and assuming the same countings rule apply. So what are we trying to show here? I think it does show potentially very serious implications for current and future planting rates and highlights the urgent challenge and the clear need to approach forest planting targets set out in the Climate Action Plan. Just briefly looking towards for future resilience within forests, and while our forests can provide pathways to mitigating the effects of climate change, 
We must also be conscious of the effects that changing environmental conditions can have. And there, I think there's a need to develop resilient forests as well as a need to build knowledge and capacity. We need to be well placed in terms of climate change adaptation challenges. And future approaches will include selecting the appropriate species, selecting mixes in the right places with appropriate objectives and management approaches. So in, in this slide, um, I will present a sample of ongoing Tuggles collaborative research geared towards building such resilience. So firstly, regarding tree breeding and improvement, briefly, the Irish Birch and Alder Improvement Programme has been to the fore in making improved native material available to owners for planting. And this important work continues by Tox researcher Oliver Sheridan in, in, the, in the slide. A new project called Fit Forests will focus on key species used in Irish forestry to provide up-to-date information on the best provenances and seed origins adapted for future Irish climatic conditions. This project is led by Dr. Niall Farley in collaboration with UCD, NUI Maynut, Quilte, with funding from the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Tuggles researcher Dr. Miguel Gritz is, is working to build genetic resources of ash composed of individual genotypes with a high degree of tolerance to ash dieback. And this will be used to bulk up stocks of tolerant trees, as well as establishing seed producing orchards. And this work is in close collaboration with um, Queen Mary University, London, and valuable co collaboration with other partners across Europe who facilitate screening for disease tolerance. Looking at forest management and the Trans SS Far pro project is building on a previous project and looking at look, the um, continuous cover concept. So moving from a regular citrus spruce plantation up to developing continuous cover and looking at the tinning regimes for that, which is an important um, option for the future. Dr. Ian Short is looking at broadleaf silviculture and restructuring. And this, again, is a very important um, process for building future resistance. And another project which looks at integrating pest management for the pine weevil in Ireland will look at a, a range and explore a range of opportunities for control of this important pest. Moving on finally to hedgerows and to, to briefly look at um, some of the issues around that. Um, hedge, hedgerows, carbon emissions or removals from hedgerows are currently not accounted for. Um, the accounting requirements should capture emissions or removals compared with a reference or base period. So in this regard, while our national hedgerow resource is a significant carbon stock, it is the additional sequestration over and above a baseline that is important. And a number of collaborative projects um, in relation to the extent and sequestration capacity of hedgerows and other landscape features are either completed or underway. And the next slide will show this progression. So looking at, in 2011, Tagus produced a hedgerow map of Ireland based on 2005 art of photography. All areas of mature hedgerows, individual trees, and non-forest woodland and scrub areas were digitally mapped to a one meter resolution. So the result was national cover of these categories was estimated at approximately 450,000 hectares or 6.4% of the land area with an 80% accuracy. A collaborative EPA funded project completed in 2014 used LIDAR data to estimate that hedgerow and non-forest woodlands could potentially sequester 0.66 to 3.3 tonne of CO2 equivalents per hectare per year. These exclude potential emissions, of course, from hedgerows, management and disturbance. More recently, a collaborative EPA funded project with the acronym BRIAR examined biomass retrieval using remote sensing and the outputs gave an estimated hedgerow lint of 600 and 89,000 kilometers, a very significant resource, 
The project made some recommendations, including a five-year national pine cloud based in inventory of hedgerows and work in terms of looking at the differences between managed and unmanaged hedgerows, looking at direct assessment of carbon stock in the field and considering of carbon stored in banks on which hedgerows are planted. And to follow on from this, Togus is currently collaborating in a farm carbon project, which is led by the EPA and co-funded by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. This project is very timely as a follow-on from projects using remote sensing assessments and has a number of important objectives. It involves field study sites and subsequent analysis, which will assess both above and below ground hedge biomass, litter fall and soil organic carbon. And our photo shows uh, Tagus researcher Lillian O'Sullivan from Johnstone Castle at work. The project develops the um, a hedgerow carbon accumulation model and a model to consider soil organic carbon under hedgerows as well. So outputs will be very valuable in terms of improving the estimated carbon dynamics, for example, sequestration and storage and impacts of management. It also involves the development of a scorecard for assessment of hedgerows, which is a further important element. Finally, new hedgerows, and this slide summarizes the extent of hedgerows, newly planted trees and newly planted orchards under farmer and current agri-environmental schemes. So we can see that over 6,600 kilometers of new hedgerows have been established since the commencement of the initial Rural Environmental Protection Scheme and almost 3.8 million new trees were planted, so quite considerable. So just to conclude, some of my final take-home messages well-designed and appropriately managed farm forests have significant potential to deliver climate change and many other benefits. Again, it's not a silver bullet. I think we have shown that pathways exist both within and outside the forest, but there is much work to, to be done and the challenge is to sustainably deliver on targets. And this delivery can be achieved through a range of mechanisms, which I've outlined, so increasing sustainably the forest cover, managing our forests, minimizing deforestation, which is netted off our targets, optimizing long-lived harvested wood products, as we've seen from some of the graphics, and appropriate use of wood to substitute for energy intensive materials or fossil fuel energy. So I'll finish with that. Hopefully we have got some messages out of that and we can take up in the forthcoming question and answer session. So thank you for your attention. And just Mark, before I finish, I think we discussed this. I have included a slide here, which I think will be shared afterwards, which involves useful links that occurred during the presentation. So this will be available and perhaps will be useful for participants that have joined in today in terms of accessing further information. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, the, the, we will include this on the PDF that will be up on the Chagas website. So if anyone wants to uh, get further information about the, the, some of the, the figures behind Tom's presentation, they're available there. Th Tom, thanks very much for that. That was an excellent overview of where we're standing with the, 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 the I suppose, the, the carbon side of, of forestry. I suppose one of the big questions, um, and you mentioned it in your last slide, is to, to increase sustainably the, the forest cover in Ireland. I know we've been, we've been hovering around the 11th percent marker for, for some years now. Um, you know, it's a big statement to make, you know, we need to, to increase sustainably, but how can we do that? Or what are, what's holding us back from increasing that, that area under, under uh, forestry in this country? I suppose there's, there's a quite a lot of elements to, to that um, question, Mark. And if we look at previous studies, the, the decision to plant some forestry, it's a complex decision um, process for farmers and there's different drivers. There's physical, economic and socio-cultural drivers there. Um, but I think on, on balance, we interact with a lot of farmers and landowners and there, there is um, quite an interest in, in, in forests 
and um, and again in, engaging with forest is, is, with forest owners is an, an important and um, part of that. Um, what I'd like to see if you can if you can see this here, um, I think myself uh, that farmers and landowners are actually if delivering messages are the best advocates of um, forestry as a as a land use option. And that booklet that I've sh just shown there, a a Forest to Suit um, Every Farm, um, it's a compilation of 17 different case studies. And I think they're very good case studies with very good messages being delivered by a range of farmers across different enterprises um, right throughout the country. This was recently launched by, by our director. And I think it tells a lot of different stories, different approaches of the multiple benefits of forestry. So we think of forestry as timber production, but the case studies there show a whole range of other approaches from recreation, reducing the day-to-day -day stresses of life, um, using um, forests for um, other processes, um, continuous cover forest adoption, and innovative approaches. For example, um, one, one award-winning farmer who has looked at putting some forestry on the marginal land and using the premium income to, to lease in better land. So developing a forest resource and at the same time enhancing the capacity to farm. So I think well, it's a can very... Can I clarify, you, you've mentioned in your presentation that the, the MAC curve is contingent on, is it 2.1 million tonnes of CO2 equivalents over the, the next, uh, is it oh, between now and 2030? Um, yes. What sort of planting rates are needed to achieve that or increase in planting rates? Is there a change required? There, I think there's an immediate change re required in terms of our planting rates. Um, uh, now, because of, of that rolling period that I, I showed in, in the slide, previous planting will come um, into the reckoning for our targets up to 2030. But again, if we're looking towards the end of, uh, of this next decade and well beyond 2030, if we're going towards carbon neutrality, it's essential that we move to higher planting rates on a sustainable basis to uh, um, ensure that we continue to have our forests as a, an appreciable sink um, going forward beyond 2030 and up towards 2050. So I think I showed in the slide that it, it's, a big challenge, but it's also very, very um, important if you're looking towards those targets. Pat, we, we've got quite a few, a lot of yep. interest in, in this topic today, uh, a lot of questions coming through. So um, maybe we'd, we'll try and move through them as quickly as possible. So, so Tom, if, if you don't mind to try and uh, keep your responses as, as concise as possible, because there, there are lot, a lot of questions coming through here. I suppose oh, re re related to uh, the, the question you asked are what are the key policy um, initiatives that could assist in the increase in, in increased planting or are there policy uh, barriers there? Yeah, well, I suppose Tugus doesn't get into the policy side of things, but if, if you're looking at maybe recent feedback from um, you know from different sources that okay it's, it's probably important to expedite any pinch points that are in the system maybe for in terms of the approval system and also in the appeal system and I think that is a priority that is um, shared right across the forest sector with all stakeholders um, so that that is important other feedbacks we can get as well is that we'd say if we look at agri environmental schemes such as reps that um, the i suppose uh, a, a good uh, connection with forestry in terms of um, integration of schemes has worked well in the past so maybe it would be an option there um, as well to consider but again it's 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 not tugs's role really to get into the policy but if we look at the recent proposals um, for government i think there's 17 measures um, in all that relate to forestry and land use and um, again listening to recent feedback i think is very positive and that there's quite a range of measures there that if looked at and 
perhaps adopted in a, an appropriate way can make a positive contribution to our targets. Okay, a question there, where do you see the, the, the role for uh, agroforestry and, and uh, it, I suppose both in terms of, of uh, land use and also in terms of, of uh, sequestering carbon? Okay, and, and as I've shown in terms of the sequestering, as I've shown um, in this slide, um, um, it's one of the grant and premium categories and there's 12 categories in all and um, agroforestry um, what isn't one of the higher um, categories to sequester carbon, we'll say to productive, faster grown species. Agroforestry typically would look at planting highly um, high quality, we'd say broadleaf trees um, in conjunction with um, other systems such as silvopastoral or silvoarable. At the moment, silvopastoral is in the, the program. So, but um, I suppose we can't look at carbon sequestration on its own. We can also look at the range of benefits that um, systems like agroforestry can provide, um, both from the forestry side and also from the, the farming side, such as animal welfare. There's evidence of um, in, in improved um, production within, within um, cattle uh, systems. Um, there's also evidence that there's, um, it, it dries up the, the land and there's a better trafficability maybe towards the end of the season. So quite a range of benefits. There's biodiversity benefits and it can be used in different systems maybe for water quality protection as well. So again, we have to, I suppose, take a holistic view of each and, and assess each category in its own merits. And again, I'm getting back to the balance between um, the environmental side and maybe does the economic side as well, of course, that, that um, we, we need to take on board and have a balanced approach, I think is important. Okay, there's a, there's a few questions about uh, afforestation on, on uh, peat uh, soils and peat lands. One in relation to uh, maybe currently unused or, or, or uh, finished uh, uh, Bordemona extraction sites and a more general one on, on uh, peatlands in the broader landscape. What is the potential role for forestry there? Yeah, okay, and I think we, we, we've, um, we're aware in the past of a potential collaboration between, between parties on midland peats in, in terms of, of establishing some native woodland on that. Um, so I think that is, is something that's, that's um, in, in the uh, progression. Um, on, a, on a wider level, in terms of looking at peatland sites and um, the, the policy around planting peatland sites is contained in a 2016 publication by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, which is called Land Types for Afforestation. And I think that's, that reference will be in the, the slide that, it, that we'll share afterwards. And within this policy, it is looking at um, a system to assess the production, the productive side as well as the environmental side. So from the production side, there are restricted um, peat land types in, in this document, which include the likes of wet heats, dry heats, um, and ra raised peats. Um, the assessment uses um, categories of vegetation cover to give an indication of nutrition and suitability. Um, so this is um, used as a process in terms of selecting um, peat sites. Now there is evidence as well in terms of, and it's in the MAC curve maybe, of rewetting of peats. And there's evidence for that coming along in terms of certain peat types as well. So I suppose we have to look at the science that is there and make the best um, decisions for land use in those areas. Question here, uh, it says, first of all, great presentation. Uh, as biodiversity is great, greatest in woodland ages, is this taken into account in, in new woodland planting? Um, certainly is, and I, I think sometimes people have a perception, if we look at the more productive forests, they may have a perception that it's 100% of one species, which is called a monoculture, but over the recent decades, we've moved away from that. And um, 
we look at a GPC category, which, which would include a productive conifer such as spruce or others, and also an inclusion of 15% of a broadleaf species, that's a requirement. And a further requirement is to leave 15% of the area as open space or retained habitat for biodiversity enhancement. And that participant's question is, is, is um, very informed in that we can use tools within the forest system at the moment, including edge management, management of the setbacks that I showed in the slides to enhance biodiversity. And also there's a, a change in biodiversity over a rotation. It's higher at an earlier stage. We can use um, good quality practice such as tinning to um, leave more light into forests. And at the later stages, again, the biodiversity tends to increase. And a lot of forest owners that I've encountered have a strong interest in biodiversity as well as production. And many of them, including in our booklet, have actually used a mix of species, which I think might be a pathway to um, improve biodiversity as well as retaining productive forests. Okay, there's a, there's a couple of questions in relation to, to water. One uh, is just asking the question uh, about the, the Woodlands for Water scheme. If there are risk areas for water quality that are not necessarily adjacent uh, to, the, uh, to a stream, is there a potential to, to avail of that scheme a little bit further back or how far back can you go from a water course in relation to it? And uh, yeah. I'll give you the, the other question yeah. was, relating to, I suppose, the broader impact of forestry on uh, water quality and the, the forestry plantations over a period of, of, if you take it right from the 80s right through to, to the, the early noughties. Okay, so um, firstly, in terms of that, that, that um, woodland for water measure, again, it's, it, um, it, it involves um, an, an undisturbed setback along with native woodland, but that na native woodland can be part of um, any possible forest um, enterprise. So it can be located, um, as the participant suggests, in different uh, locations and in different ways. So it's very flexible. So I think it has good, good potential for, for adoption um, in terms of maybe the, the, the farming system and improving biodiversity as well as water quality. Um, on the broader issue of, of water quality, going back to the 90s, um, and again, like I said, forest practice has changed significantly. Um, sometimes people consider legacy forests, which I call them, which um, have changed quite a lot. So the practices now are, um, they're adhered to and they're, they're set in a environmental requirements for forestry publication, which is all quite a number of years and updated the previous guidelines, which includes um, if we're looking at um, drainage within forestry, there are silt traps required at the ends and throughout the drainage system. There's a setback required for all drains. So no drain will, will um, approach a, a water body. Um, so there, there's quite a, a range of measures there um, that look to protect the, the integrity of, of water quality and routinely broad, some broadleaves will be used, um, riparian broadleaves, close to water courses, which will give it an extra layer of, of protection. Um, there was an issue back in the 90s with acid sensitivity areas and at the time was coming um, was arising from what was seen as um, pollutants coming from the continent of Europe at the time. We heard of things like acid rain and forests were um, at the time um, looked at as concentrating some of these pollutants uh, and in the canopy and not maybe some of them reaching the, the base of, of, of the forest. Um, but since then, that has changed considerably. Um, the pollution due to the, uh, legislation in Europe, th that has stopped. Um, so what I was supposed to summarize, the strict adherence to the range of guidelines that are there that are routinely used by forests, which, and, and along with sustainable management. And um, I, 
I, I suppose, a, a very clear approach to that um, can ameliorate any of those concerns. Okay. Just one other really interesting question uh, uh, relating to forest premiums. Uh, and do you see, given that uh, certain types of, of forest have a higher sequestration uh, capability, do you see a potential where you, you may get uh, a relationship between the level of premium and the level of uh, sequestration in, in different forest types? Um, it's a possibility, and I know that um, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine have looked at systems, for example, in the UK, there's a woodland carbon code. Now, they're, they're, it's at the stage of, of investigating it, see, has it maybe applications here? Um, and again, we don't get into the policy, policy side, but um, speaking to owners, I think they would welcome such an initiative if it is a runner and it's feasible to implement. But again, that's a, a, a policy decision, I think, that is outside, outside our scope. Tom, we have a few questions in relation to the, uh, I, I think it's the 1946 Act, where if you plan forestry, uh, it must remain in forestry. Um, the question is here is, uh, I mean, is this limiting the amount of forestry that's being planted, or has there been any uh, survey work done with, with farmers around their attitudes uh, to this? Uh, yes, if we look at some of the uh, previous analysis, which is, is carried out, including by Togusk, and maybe we've, we, we've looked at um, the different um, issues that are raised, and one of those would be the permanent nature of forestry. Um, so it is something that, um, is, that owners would look at as being um, maybe a bit of a barrier, even though we say if, if marginal land is being considered, forestry can be a very good um, land use option on that land, the, the long-term nature or the permanence of forestry can be seen as um, a barrier to, to that. Okay, thanks, thanks, Tom. Uh, just to go back to the original question around the, the forestry planting figures and the percent, we were talking more um, percentages and tons of carbon uh, uh, equivalents being uh, sequestered. But in terms of actual hectares, uh, what sort of how does that translate in in hectares? In terms of hectares, uh, where we're at at the moment now compared to where we need to be at? Is that on a national level? Uh, I think so, that's um, on a national level. Well, really, yes, on a national level. Um, yes. Well, at at the moment, um, our plan as a, our planting figures are low they're well below the targets and um so what we need to do is to to achieve this um up to two million uh, tons of carbon dioxide equivalents each year over the next decade um as i said earlier the, the previous planting and taking into account the the rolling ar the, the rolling transition period um previous planting well, we'll get credit for that um, over the next decade, but coming towards the end of that period and definitely into the 2030 period, if we, the Climate Action Plan looks at 8,000 hectares of new planting per annum as a target, and I think we'd need to be looking seriously at, it, at the options for, for achieving that and even exceeding it if possible. Um, even front-loading it, I think, would be very beneficial. But again, that's down to the, um, I suppose, the opportunities that are taken there for that, for that um, decision. Just have, uh, I suppose, we'll take it as a comment. Uh, people are uh, one comment here of why why we don't get into policy. Um, surely, it should be evidence informed policy and research uh, that should drive policy. And of course, that is the case. I think the point that you were making, Tom, is that that we don't make the policy but it's our, our, our role to inform policy and that it's evidence-based as, as much as possible. Would that be fair to say? Uh, yeah, it certainly is. And I, I showed a sample of research projects with, um, um, in one of the slides, and I suppose that, that would be our role, develop the, the knowledge and the capacity to inform policy, but we don't make the policy ourselves. 
So as well as those research projects, there's quite a number of others that are ongoing and they're very valuable in terms of informing um, um, that's, that sort of a framework. Um, we had a question earlier on there in relation to, I suppose we've learned a lot of lessons from, from planting during the 80s, uh, that there was probably some unsuitable planting taking place during that period. Um, it says, in the same time frame, has any estimation been made of the extent of hedgerows being removed from the Irish landscape? Um, and you know, the, uh, do we know the overall effect of uh, the, the, the commercial forestry planting during the 1980s uh, to 2010, negative or positive? So two questions there really in one. Yeah, okay, so um, the Briar Project has done some work on, on um, the extent of, of hedgerows and um, in the period between 2000, I think two and 2015, there has been a level of um, reduction in hedgerows. Uh, in other words, they've been taken out, um, which if we're looking at the, the, the whole accounting would have implications there. Um, but as far as I know, it, it, that, that rate has declined significantly in recent years. And sorry, the, the other question was? Uh, the, sorry, the first part of the question was in relation to the positive or negative impact on water quality and biodiversity from these plantings that uh, took place during the 1980s to 2010 period. What, what would be your estimation on that? Or has, are there any uh, papers around that? Um, there, there, ha there has been work done on, on, on uh, we say, the influence of, of early um, forests going back to that time. And um, as I said, the, the, the forestry practice has moved on a lot. Um, but we'd say um, on sensitive sites such as peatland sites, there would have been papers to show some episodic um, um, effects on water quality, but that they would be temporary. Um, for a long time now, practice in terms of not just the establishment, but the whole area of um, forest management and particularly felling and extraction, there's, there's clear guidelines there um, that inform that, which look at um, a range of met methods and methodologies to mitigate any potential negative impacts. So they're in place like the afforestation guidelines for, for quite a, wh a while and um, strict adherence to those is, al is always uh, very important. Very good. Thank you, uh, Tom. Um, I think we're, 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 we're moving close to the end of uh, the webinar now. So I think what we'll do is uh, we'll start to wrap things up. So Tom, in summary, I mean, we need to look at um, increased planting rates. We need to look at uh, more uh, sustainable management of existing forest covers. Um, anything else that you'd, you'd add to, to that in summary? Well, yeah, if, I, if I'm summarizing, and maybe this is a, this is a personal view, but um, sometimes I, I think maybe there, there's maybe um, dividing lines in opinion between forests. And sometimes, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, um, it, it comes out in different formats. But I think what we need, and I firmly believe this, that we need a, a balanced approach to forestry in terms of future afforestation. Um, it, can, it can be a great land use option, we say, in appropriate areas on the farm and, and can be used for a range of purposes. But I think we also need the productive side of forestry. I think so a balanced approach to that is very important. And I, I think I recently in an article quoted uh, David Attenborough, who, who said that forests are a, a, a very valuable res resource and sustainable management of those forests benefits um, the owners as well as the planet. But on their own, our natural forests, which we want to protect, won't supply the timber we need. So a balanced approach. And I think maybe if, if that can be taken on board by different parties, um, that we can move forward with a consensus view that will probably be very good for the forestry sector in Ireland. Tom, thanks very much for that uh, excellent way to end uh, our webinar today. Just uh, to let our audience uh, know that uh, from next week, we'll be talking to uh, Dr. Dara Hulakon and Owen Fenton around the, uh, the water cycle. 
uh, where does it, the water go? And I suppose linking some of the questions that were asked today about the, the, the location of mitigation actions within the landscape and understanding sediment losses to water quality. Often we, we focused uh, largely on the nutrient side of things, but sediment is, is also a really important uh, part of the whole water quality story. Um, if you want to find out more about other webinars that uh, Changus has on offer, uh, please do go to the Changus website. Uh, where you see under Changus Daily on the quick links, you see all of the various different uh, webinars that are available, in particular the uh, food industry development uh, and dairy research webinars are particularly tailored to our connected audiences. If you want to uh, join Connected, uh, Changus Connected Digital is now available for free. Uh, simply go to the Changus Connected uh, site there and click join today and put in your, your details and um, you will then uh, receive updates on future events uh, and uh, training opportunities available from Chagask. So um, please do, do check that out uh, when, when you get a chance. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, our speaker today, Tom Houlihan, uh, Pat Murphy for helping us with the questions, and of course, the overall coordination of, of the series. Uh, I want to thank Noel Meehan, uh, Pat Murph, uh, Yvonne Marr, and Andy Boland also uh, in the uh, our production team. So do join us next week uh, from all of the team. Thanks for your attention today, and we look forward to seeing you again uh, during our other webinar series. Thank you. <laughs>